Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We got a good crowd tonight. Uh, thank every single one of you for being here and making the effort to uh, come together to worship God in spirit and in truth and be where we should be. And so it's encouraging. And, uh, we really, really appreciate you for doing that. And we are going to our sermon tonight. We're going to talk about encouragement. Uh, and that's one of the issues that we'll look at. So we do appreciate everyone being here. On our uh, continuing prayer list, uh, we don't really have a lot of updates uh, from this morning, except we did get a little bit of good news uh, Steve brought in about Warren Skelton. So we had announced, you know, he's an elder at Sweetwater, and he's been diagnosed as stage four lung cancer. But he went to the doctor, and he got a little bit better report. He, he does have the cancer, but they think it's treatable with radiation. They think they can cure it. They can help him out. So... I know it wasn't all that long ago, stage four lung cancer, that was kind of a, that was a death sentence, you know, but so apparently uh, they really are pretty confident that they can take care of that for him. And so, uh, but please keep praying for him. And let's hope that everything goes well there. Jacqueline, of course, is still at home recuperating from her surgery. So keep praying for her and you know, everybody else is about the same as far as I'm aware of. So another, uh, Announcements that we have in North Bradley and Cleveland be having a gospel meeting March 24th through the 27th. T.J. Kirk will be doing the preaching at 7 o'clock each night, and there is a flyer in the foyer about that. Uh, the area-wide singing, congregational singing, will be held at Inglewood. That will be a week from today, next Sunday on March 24th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you could support that, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Uh, and gentlemen, remember we do have a, a men's business meeting tomorrow, and I do pledge to get you out of here before midnight. Not tomorrow. Do what? Not tomorrow. Did I say tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> Tonight we're going to have a, well, if I kept you past midnight, that would be tomorrow, wouldn't it? But we are going to try to have a meeting tonight, so anyway, we'll plan for that. So that's all I have. So uh, at the proper time, Brother Steve will lead us in our opening prayer, and then uh, Brother Maurice will have our dismissal prayer at the conclusion of services. So at this time, we'll turn the song service over to Brother Shell. Amen, everybody. Amen. Please get your song book at time number 249. Time is filled with swift transition.
the time that he spends in preparing the lessons and presenting them to us. And we ask you to open our minds and our hearts to what you're absorbing. And Father, as we're here to worship you, we're here to worship you, Father, because we love you. And we know you love us right back. We ask you to forgive us from our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Please turn to number 514. We'll sign this before the lesson. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in. Returning to the book of Acts tonight, a lot of our lesson will come from the book of Acts. So if you'll go ahead and be turning there. There is a man that we read about in the Bible, goes by the name of Barnabas. Well, who was Barnabas exactly? Well, we know that he was one of the apostles. And so if you will turn to Acts chapter 14... In verse 14, now he was not one of the original 12, but later he was appointed as one of the apostles. So we see this in Acts 14 and verse 14, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out. So we see that Barnabas was one of the apostles. We know that he accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. And we want to notice in Acts chapter 11, we see that Luke gives us a little bit more information here about Barnabas. Let's begin reading in verse 22. The Bible says, Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the, glory, the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. So we see a lot of good information here uh, about Barnabas. He exhorted people, which is really what our lesson is about tonight. Uh, he wanted them to cleave unto the Lord. He was encouraging them to do that. We're told here he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He was a faithful man. And a lot of people were added to the Lord. So he had a hand in converting uh, a lot of people according to the gospel of Christ. And so Barnabas was a very valuable worker uh, in the cause of Christ. Now, 
There's something else interesting that we want to note about him. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 4, we're going to know here that Barnabas was not even his original name. It was a name given to him by the other apostles. So look at Acts 4 in verse 36. The Bible says, And Joseph, Joseph, or Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus. And so we see Barnabas was from Cyprus. He's from the tribe of Levi. And notice that this name Barnabas, this was a surname. It tells us, what does that mean? Well, it's, it's a nickname. And like most people, you get a nickname because it's, maybe it sums up a, something that defines your character or in some way describes you. And so we're told here, being interpreted the son of consolation. Okay, consolation, another word for that is encouragement. Barnabas was a person who consoled people. He encouraged people enough so that he must have been known for that so they give him this nickname. Well, your name's Joseph. We're going to call you Barnabas because you're a great encourager. Okay? And so tonight, we want to take a look at Barnabas. Uh, we want to see what we can learn from him because just like the people then, you and I today, we need a lot of encouragement. We need to encourage each other. That's what we should be doing as children of God, and that's what Barnabas was known for. And so we want to take a look at tonight, what are some ways that we can encourage each other and even other people out there? What are some ways that we can do that like Barnabas did? And so tonight we want to look at, like we did this morning, we looked at three uh, facts about our lesson. Tonight we want to look at three different ways. There are others I'm sure we could come up with, but for time's sake, Three different ways how you and I as children of God, how can we encourage each other? So first of all, we want to note that we can encourage people by our example. Because this is something that Barnabas did. And so we want to look at kind of two subcategories here in example. First of all, let's talk about by our giving. Okay? Because we see this is something that Barnabas did. If you look at Acts 4 and verse 37... We need to have, as Christians, we need to have a giving nature. We need to be willing to help others in any way that we can. So we want to notice here that Barnabas, he was a giving individual. He had this spirit of giving. So notice Acts 4 and verse 37. It says, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. It's talking about Barnabas. And so he had some land and he sold that. And he laid it at their feet. Now, we looked at Ananias this morning, how he lied about he kept some of the money for himself. But he didn't have to lie because we saw that you were under no obligation to do this. And neither was Barnabas. And so he chose to do this because he knew that the work of the church required money. We need money to do things in the work of the church. And it's very discouraging when you know that there's things that need to be done and things that God wants us to do and expects us to do, but the finances simply are not available to get done what we need to get done. Well, that's very discouraging to people. So Barnabas, always being the encourager, he wanted to provide some financial assistance so they could do the work of the church. Because when progress is being made, and a lot of times that takes money, that's an encouragement to people. So it's just one way... Uh, that we can encourage. And so you and I, a lesson for us is we should give as much as we can because we want the work of the church to be funded. We want the work of the church to continue and let's do what Barnabas did. But on the other hand, we do want to emphasize that when we talk about giving, it's not just about money. That's the first thing that comes to people's mind. And yes, it's important and we got to have it. But I want to encourage us to realize that we need to be willing to give. We need to have a spirit of giving, not just from our wallet or from our bank account. We need to give other things as well, okay? We need to be willing to give of our time. And sometimes we all feel like time is almost more valuable than money because we're all really busy and we've got so many things that we've got to do. What happens with a lot of people is they put God on the back burner. And they don't give a lot of time to the work of the church because they're busy 
doing the, the daily cares of this world. It's so easy for us all to get consumed by those kind of things. We've got to be willing to give God our time. God wants our time so that we can teach the gospel to others, reach lost souls. That's what we're supposed to be doing. That takes money, but it also takes time that we have to be willing to give. Now, we can also give not just of our money and not just of our time, but we need to give of our talents. Different people have different talents and different abilities, and we get, you know, the human side of us. We tend to think that, well, some people in the church are more important than others. Well, maybe the elders are more important or the preachers more important. Or I've told it, we're all in this together. Nobody is above anybody else. God sees us all as his children, and everybody has valuable functions to serve. It's it not just, well, I don't have to be a preacher. I don't have to be an elder. I don't have to be a deacon. Those are all very valuable things. But everybody has certain talents that they can lend to the church that helps with the work of the church. And we've had people here that have done various things that maybe I don't have a clue how to do these things, but some of you guys have pitched in and you've taken care of those things. Well, that's valuable. That, that's a spirit of giving, and that's encouraging to everybody. And when we see people use their talents to get things done that needs to be done so the work of the church can go on. So we need to give of our money, we need to give of our time, and we need to give of our talent. Barnabas was willing uh, to do all of those things. So we can lead by example with our giving. Now, we can also encourage people by our actions. That's another way to lead by example. So we know from what we read here that Barnabas, he lived a life of service to God. That's what he was about. And so people were inspired by Barnabas. They were encouraged by him. It said that he helped to convert a lot of people. No doubt because he encouraged them to follow the Lord. And, and the way that he went about it was inspiring and encouraging to people. And so that was a very positive thing. So when we think about our behavior, the way we act, the actions that we participate in, when we think about spiritual matters, we have an influence on other people. We may not even realize it. We may not realize who is watching us. But let me tell you one thing. God is always watching, so keep that in mind. But among fellow humans, you know, sometimes maybe you're doing something you don't realize. Somebody's paying attention. Somebody's watching. And you never know who you can influence by your actions, by your behavior. If they see you doing good things. And that's what we need to be about. So we have the power by our actions, by our behavior. We can encourage people or we can discourage people all based on our behavior and what people witness us and what they see that we do. So if we are known to, we're living our lives, we're doing everything we can, as we said this morning, you don't have to be perfect, but people, if they look at us and say, you know what, he or she is, they really seem like all the time they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do things that are pleasing to God. Well, that's encouraging to a lot of people. That's a very positive example uh, to set. Now, on the other hand, if we are doing things that we shouldn't be doing, especially because people look at us and say, well, I, I thought that guy was supposed to be a Christian, or I thought, doesn't she go to church down there? And, you know, and they, they see us, if we're engaged in sinful behavior, especially those of us that claim to be children of God, that can certainly discourage people and drag other people down. Well, if he's not even doing the right thing, then why should I do the right thing? I mean, he claims to be a child of God, and he's no better than anybody else. That, that's going to lead people away from God. It's not going to encourage them to come to God. So we want to avoid those kind of things. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22. We have a very good piece of advice here, and it's not just a piece of advice. It's a command. Okay, it's what God is telling us to do. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22. Not only are we not to be engaged in sinful activity, but notice, abstain from all appearance of evil. We don't even need to look like we're, we may be in some place that a lot of bad things go on. Maybe we're not doing it, but we're there and people see that. And they don't know what we're doing. So we, we don't even need to have the appearance 
of being involved in sinful activities or evil activities. We've got to be mindful of the influence that we have on other people. So again, if people see that we're always trying to do the right thing like Barnabas was, that, that's encouraging to other people. And we want to encourage people to come to Jesus. We want to encourage people to come to church and worship God and do all the right things. That's what we need to be doing. So we can do all these things by the example that we set, like Barnabas did. Well, secondly, we can influence people, we can encourage people with our words, and as we want to see, both verbally and in written form. So with our words, we need to be exhorting people. Look at Acts again, chapter 14, verse 22. We need to continually remind each other, as we talked about this morning, we were looking at temptation, and we said, don't fool yourself into thinking you're the only one that's dealing with temptation. We are all in the same boat. We all have to deal with that. Well, the same thing, we need to continually remind each other as children of God, we're not alone. There are others who are striving to do what we're doing because it can get lonely sometimes if you think, man, I'm the only one doing this. And we've seen some, you know, some of the Old Testament prophets of God, even they got discouraged because they felt like nobody was listening and they weren't getting anywhere. Well, remember, we're all in this together we can get through this, and especially if we help each other, we need to encourage each other, especially in those dark times in our life that we all go through. We need our brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage us. We'll look at Acts 14 and verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation Enter into the kingdom of God. We've got to be reminded, yeah, it's tough sometimes. We're, we're going to go through some really bad stuff. But you're not alone. We're all going to go through it together. We're going to help each other. And we can do this. Okay, Like we said this morning, God's not going to put any temptation in front of us that we cannot resist. We want to tell ourselves, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And we get discouraged, right? We need to help each other say, yes, you quit telling yourself you can't do this. We can be pleasing to God. We can do the things that God wants us to do. It's a lie of the devil trying to tell us, no, you can't do it, so why don't you just quit? Okay, we can do this, but we need each other. Okay, it's hard to do it alone. You don't need to do it alone. And sometimes people want to be that lone wolf and, and try to do this, and it's hard. Okay, we've got to encourage each other. We've got to help each other. It's clear that Barnabas was that kind of person, that he encouraged a lot of people, and because of him, a lot of people obeyed the gospel. And that's the kind of people we want to be. Look at Acts 15 and 32. Acts 15 and 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, there's our word again, exhorted, encouraged the brethren with many words and confirmed them. So they talked to them. They built them up in the faith. They encouraged them. We all need that. From time to time. And so as children of God, that's what we're to be about. We can use our words in a very positive way to help people who are discouraged get that encouragement that they need. Well, what about in writing? We can do that as well in written communication. You know, there's a lot of people that are very active on social media. Okay, you all know I ain't one of them. I don't do Facebook, I don't do Twitter, computers hate me, right? So I don't do that stuff, but I'm not ignorant of the fact that billions of other people do. You know, it's the world we live in today, and so so many people are active. Well, like any other tool, this can be positive or negative. Nothing inherently evil or bad about Facebook or Twitter or, or any of those things, right? It can be a tool for good or it can be a tool for either just like the radio can or the tv can the internet whatever you want to talk about so we need to ask ourselves or those of you that are using it how are you using it how are you using it barnabas and the others we notice here in acts 15 we just looked at verse 32 look at the verse before that verse 31 they wrote to encourage other people Acts 15, 31, which when they had read, 
They rejoiced for the consolation, for the encouragement. The words that Barnabas and the others wrote to them was an encouragement to them. It encouraged them to keep going, to keep trudging ahead. Don't quit. Don't give up. Stay faithful in the Lord. Do what you're supposed to do. And it says here they rejoiced over that. It boosted their spirit. We, we all need that. And so I think you'll all agree with me. It just, just by what I've seen and heard, it's true that so many people today use social media to tear others down. They, they think they have some kind of sense of immunity. It's not face to face. Maybe a lot of people, they'll say stuff online that they would never say to somebody's face. And so they'll use this. I know when I was a school teacher, it was pretty much a daily thing that you'd hear kids squabbling about what somebody said on Facebook the night before, and they were just about to punch each other out. It was almost a daily thing. Right? And so people will use this to tear down. They will write very hateful things, very hurtful things. No Christian should ever do anything like that. Ever. There's no excuse for doing that. Use that platform. You want to get on it? Great. Use it for messages of positivity. Use it for encouragement for other people. Show them this is what it means to be a Christian. We're not like everybody else. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We are not in the destruction business, right? We don't want to tear other people down and destroy people's reputation and those kind of things. So use the platform to encourage others. Use the platform to spread the gospel of Christ. Use the platform to spread the spirit of Christ. We can use it for so many positive things and try to counteract all that negativity that's out there. So that's what we need to do with the written communication that we have as well. And then also, we want to think as we turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we need to remind each other as we go through this life, as we go through all the temptations that we face, as we go through the, the sorrow and the suffering and the death and the disease and all these horrible things we have to deal with, Remind each other that we have a reward waiting for us. We don't want to lose track of that, and we often do. We get so wrapped up in all the bad things that are happening here that we don't remember we have a better place waiting for us as long as we stay faithful. we got to remind each other about that as we encourage each other to stay faithful. Remember what's waiting for us. We talk, we've talked before about it where Paul said, you know, the Christian life is like running a race. You're trying to get to the finish line. And in a human race, you may get some little gold trophy. You may get a monetary prize. Well, all that, you know, it's not going to go with you to the cemetery. What good is it going to do? But the prize we get is an eternal prize. That it'll never rust. It'll never corrupt. We'll never lose it. we got to remind each other of that. So take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. We want to see that it makes the difficulties of this life worth it. But we've got to encourage each other about that. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now look at verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another. Encourage one another. That's what we have waiting for us after we get through all the drudgery that we got to get through in this life. We can go up and be with the Lord forever. And there'll be no more problems. There'll be no more sickness, disease, suffering, sorrow, death, pain. All those things will be gone forever. We got to remind ourselves of that as we go through these horrible things that we got to deal with. So the best way to do that is for us to continually be encouraging each other like Barnabas did. Well, finally tonight, another way that we can encourage each other is with our presence. So we can encourage each other by example, we can encourage each other with our words, and we can encourage each other with our presence. 
So first, let's think about in the first century. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. The Christians in the first century, they took great comfort. They had great joy from being together. It meant something to them because they would encourage each other during their times of worship, during their times of fellowship together. They provided tremendous encouragement for each other. Look at Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 21. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. They took comfort in being together, being reunited with the with each other, seeing each other, worshiping together. That was important to them, just like it better be to us today. Turn over to Hebrews 10, 25. This ought to be a verse that should, we ought to have it basically memorized by now, should be very familiar because it is very encouraging for us when we can gather together to worship God in spirit and in truth. The, the woke people today, they often want to talk about safe spaces, right? And, and for them, it's they don't want to be around anybody that disagrees with them. They can't handle it. They need a puppy and a coloring book. And so they want to go to a, a safe space because somebody had a different opinion than I had. Well, in a sense, this is our safe space from all the chaos that's going on around us. When we come together, it is a sanctuary. It is a place. It should be a place of peace and joy and happiness, a safe space, if you will. And Hebrews 10, 25 tells us, not forsaking the assembling of the saints together as the matter of some is. It's what some people do, but you better not do that. But exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. God wants us to assemble together. It is such an uplifting joy. I know it is for me, and I think it is for you too, when everyone is here. When everyone is here, and I'm not talking about people being sick, and we understand that, and they can't be here, but when everyone is here, it's an encouragement. It's, it's a joy. And likewise, it's discouraging, whether it's this congregation, others I've been in, or others I've heard about, it's very discouraging when you have people that are supposed to be children of God who continually forsake the assembly. They can't be bothered worshiping God. They got more important things to do, like playing golf or watching that TV show on the couch. Can't come to Bible study. I'm, I'm too busy Wednesday night. I can't do that. People that do that, it's discouraging for everybody else when you know that there's somebody that should be here and could be here, but they've, they've chosen not to be here. That's depressing for us because we see a lack of commitment to God. And we expect that from people that aren't Christians, but people that call themselves Christians, they ought to have commitment, right? We, we looked at this morning in our morning Bible study, we talked about, as we're wrapping up our study of the book of Matthew, we looked at the crucifixion and the physical suffering. We looked at a doctor's point of view, and this is what Jesus went through when he was on the, cro on the cross. That's commitment. Jesus didn't commit a single sin, but he committed to me who is a sinner. He committed to me a person who's not worth it. At least in my point of view. But luckily for me, Jesus thought I was worth it. Right? I don't know why, but I'm happy that he did. We need to have commitment to God. Lord, you can hang on a cross for six hours for me. I can come worship you. I can come to Bible study. I, I can do what I need to do. It's so encouraging when people show up to do that, and it's discouraging when they don't. And you might think, well, nobody's going to care whether I'm there or not. That's false. That's false. And again, you don't know, and especially in a small congregation like ours, but even in a bigger one, people think they won't be missed. You might be surprised how many people notice that well, you know, where's Brother So-and-so? He's, he's not here. People notice those kind of things. Why do you think God wants us to worship together? 
Because we encourage each other. We edify. We build each other up. That's why God planned it. He could have done it anyway. He could have said, yeah, Mark, why don't you just worship me individually? Jesse, you can worship individually. Lane, you can worship individually. Joy, you can do it. Why didn't God? He could have done it that way. God wants us together like we are right now so we can encourage each other and build each other up. Some people will say, especially since COVID, right? Well, I, you know, I can just stay home and watch it on my laptop. I, I just worship God at home on my laptop. That is not the same thing. And when we were, you know, all the churches shut down and COVID and, and I've heard a lot of elderships are saying now they're looking back and saying, yeah, that was a mistake. But nobody knew what to do at the time. And so, you know, but they're regretting that. that yeah, that, that was bad. Just like shutting down the schools has hurt our kids. We're shutting down the churches. That hurt us spiritually. It wasn't the best thing we could have done. But no, nobody knew what to do. But, but God wants us together. So this idea, well, I can just do it at home. It's not the same. When Jacob and Janice and I were sitting on the couch in the living room when COVID was there, we're doing, we all, even my teenage son at the time, said, I don't like this. I want to be together with, with other people. I want us to worship together. It, it's important. We are social creatures. Does God not know that? Of course he does. He created us. So, we're, yeah, I know occasionally you have somebody who'd rather be by themselves, but most of us are social creatures. We need each other. And God knows we need each other. And so he, instead of telling us, yeah, it's fine to worship separately, he commanded us, no, I want you to be together. I want you to assemble and encourage each other. And it's so encouraging when we're here. So it's not the same when we try to do it at home alone. And that is not being obedient to what God told us to do. If I'm sitting at home doing it, that's not an assembly. And again, we're not talking about when somebody's sick or you know what I'm talking about. If I choose to stay home, well, I'll just worship by myself. That's not an assembly. That's, I'm not doing what God told me to do. So we can encourage each other by our presence, by being here. It's very much an encouraging. So we, we must continually encourage each other in the faith. We have to help strengthen each other because we all have those weak moments. That's why, again, we need to be together. Well, we've looked at a few key ways today. How can we do that? I'm sure we can think of others, but at a minimum, as we said, we can encourage each other by setting a good example. We can set that good example with our behavior, with our faithfulness. We encourage others by doing that. We can do it with our words, both verbally when we talk to people or in writing, with Facebook or Twitter or sending somebody a card when they're, they're sick or, or maybe they're just down or depressed about something. Sometimes a card can... Just you let somebody know you're thinking about it. A phone call, a text message. We encourage people by doing that. And then finally, we encourage by our presence, by being together at not only the worship service, but other activities of the church. If we have a work day, we need to be here. If we have a gospel meeting, we need to be here. Activities of the church, everybody needs to participate, and we need to be here uh, to encourage each other. So may God help us to commit to doing these things to build each other up in the faith. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you need to do so before it's everlastingly too late. You need to be baptized into Christ. And with that, God will add you to his church and you will become a child of his. You will become a Christian. And that's we go by the name Christian only. No other name. But you will then be a faithful child of God. If you haven't done that, we can help you do that tonight. If, on the other hand, you have done that, but you have fallen away, you're no longer committed to God because you've gone back into the world, you've gone back to sin, it's not too late. You can come back. God wants you to come back. God is pleading with you to come back. If you'll confess those sins, repent for them, pray to God for forgiveness, he's promised he will forgive you because we saw this morning God wants all men to be saved. He wants everyone here to be saved. So if you have a need, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh, why do you tarry so long? 
Your Savior is waiting to give you a place in his sanctified throne. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? What do you hope, dear brother, to gain by a further delay? There's no one to save you but Jesus. There's no other way but his way. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Do you not feel, dear brother, his spirit now striving within? Oh, why not accept his salvation and throw off thy burden of sin? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why do you wait, dear brother? The harvest is passing away. Your Savior is longing to bless you. There's danger in death and delay. Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? Why not? Why not? Why not come to him now? As always, we need to thank Brother Mark. He, he always does a good job on those lessons. Before we continue on, do we have anyone present that's not had an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper? We don't. So we'll continue on. Uh, we always need to remember each and every one that's on our prayer list. Pray for them. Pray for the sick. Pray for those that have hardships in their lives. And again, I will say, we need to pray for every soul on this earth because there's a lot of lost souls out there. A lot of them. And we, need to, we need to do that. We all need to do that. So remember, Thursday's Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. Well, Mark just got through talking about it. We all need to remember that. Service yes, to Bible study next Sunday morning at 9 30. Regular service at 10 30. Back here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. That's only a short time in our life. And we've got eternity waiting on us. So let's, let's all do what we need to do. Please turn your song books to number 708. Let's sing the third verse of this and we'll have our closing prayer. Sing the wondrous love 